I'm the content strategist for the Asia Society Policy Institute based in New York. I want to welcome you here to the ninth U.S.-China Entertainment Summit. I've been a participant and an observer and sometime an organizer of each of these, and I'm really pleased to be back here with all of you this morning. Welcome to anyone who's new, and welcome back to those of you who've joined us in the past. I think we're in for a little bit of an education here as we speak to our distinguished guests to my right. Uh, I'm going to let you read their full bios in your programs so we don't waste any precious time getting straight to the heart of the matter. <clears throat> the title of our panel today is New Frontiers and New Formats in Chinese Language Content. And in order to help our panelists better understand how to help you, I'm going to poll the audience by show of hands so we understand who you are and can help you understand what it is that we up here do in this arena. So by show of hands in the audience, please, how many people here today watched a Chinese language movie this week? All right, I see about 15 people. Okay. How many people watched a Chinese language movie this month? All right, it's about 30 people. All right, what about a Chinese movie in the last six months? Okay, got about 45 there, I'm guessing. And who has not watched, don't be shy, I know that there are some newcomers here. Who has not watched a Chinese language movie in the last year? Identify yourselves. All right. There are a few brave souls. We're here to teach this gentleman a little bit about what we do. Um, thank you very much. One last question. How many Chinese speakers in the audience do we have? Okay. So I'm going to try to save about 10 minutes time at the end of this panel to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask a question or two of our panelists. Uh, we have in simultaneous interpretation, uh, which I've forgotten to get, so I may be uh, asking you for some help, those of you who speak better Chinese than I do. Um, but uh, I, I would encourage you to ask questions in either language. You're welcome to do so. So kicking right off, um, when we talk about uh, new formats and new challenges uh, for Chinese language, I want to consider the following, that this Chinese language market uh, is much bigger than a lot of people in Hollywood uh, realized. There are now more movie screens in China than there are in the United States. Um, this market is diversifying rapidly across platforms and is developing varied tastes for different genre, different kinds of content. Um, and there are an increasing number of viewers outside of China who are finding great appeal in Chinese language content. My 14-year-old daughter who lives in Brooklyn in New York with me is one of those people. She grew up in Beijing, still speaks some Chinese, is studying Chinese again, and she's finding it pretty cool to tell her friends in New York that she understands this whole other world of entertainment. The Chinese stories that we're seeing on film and TV and the internet are beginning to intersect with other storytelling traditions. So I'm going to start with my old friend and colleague Carrie Wong, who's here from Sony. Uh, we first got to know one another when she was working with Fox. And she's in a very specific arena of this um, world, which is to do local language content. So she's making Chinese films, Chinese language films for Sony in China. So focusing on the new, I'm going to let Carrie kick off our conversation by asking her, what's new? What's new in what you do? And how has it evolved since we first met about 10 years ago? Well, um, thank you very much. My name is Carrie Wong. I, um, as mentioned, I work for Sony. Um, I'm based in Hong Kong, uh, but I travel to China like every month uh, for um, probably at least uh, 15 to 20 days a month. So um, uh, about this question, I think um, if 
uh, I think um, if you know much about China, China is a, a quick, a Chinese audience is very um, quickly adapting a new format. Um, especially the, the young millennials, they, they always watch movies or TV shows uh, on, their, on their iPhones and the iPads. So probably um, um, if we want them to stay in the cinema, we, 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 let, we should try to make something that um, relatable to them and also um, to, to make them feel um, that it's a must to watch uh, a movie in the theater. It should have like a, a good theatrical experience. That is what we should uh, try to focus. Um, especially, um, I think most of you know that, that the youngsters in China, they, they don't really want to pay uh, for, uh, for contents because all contents offered on, on the internet now, uh, the legitimate contents are, are free. Almost all of them are free, except a few uh, company like trying to start subscription business. So basically, they're very used to um, watch uh, programs uh, free online uh, on their phones. So, so what what would be new for China? I, I would I would suggest something that um, is very particular for them, like that they must see in the theater, not. Not particular like like a CGI uh, movie. One may argue like like maybe we spend money on um, special effects, we have uh, that will work, but it does just don't work because these are far from their their, their life experience. Uh, right now this year, there's a particular trend that um, some social drama, some stories that they think no one talk about, uh, would work in 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 the theater very well, such as Dying to Survive. Uh, it's a huge, amazing movie. I think you can see this film in, in, the, in, in, this, um, in this week uh, in LA. Um, and also, uh, they like to see something, what they feel nostalgic, uh, but it's not too long ago because they can't relate that experience. They, they, want, they like to relate something from the 80s, so a lot of uh, rom-com or Chinese um, coming-of-age yun drama is about going back to maybe a lifespan of uh, 10 years, talking about the 80s or the 90s, late 80s uh, or, uh, or 2000. That's something that they, they can share with, they can feel, uh, they can relate to. So um, this is something new uh, for the Chinese audience, uh, especially um, uh, they 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 do they do not like to to see, um, I would say historical uh, drama or or or, or costume movie. Uh, this is a bit too far for them now. That's a change. I certainly remember when living in Beijing from 2004 to 2012, you'd turn on the television, mm -hmm. and so often uh, you'd get costume dramas. Mm -hmm. um, so these new social issue programs yes. are new. What uh, example might you give us from Sony's work today that fits that bill? Well, um, we are trying to develop something uh, uh, now, right now, but we do not have a particular um, uh, film addressing to social drama because um, um, this is not um, an easy one to get censorship approval, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, we are more conservative, and uh, we we like to develop something like more for family. So basically, we are doing an uh, animation now uh, called With Dragon, and uh, several more in, uh, family film titles are, are being developed. And um, and and also, there's a nice trend of um, uh, sci-fi, like now getting uh, into focus. A lot of young directors in, in China want to make sci-fi movie, but not heavily CGI, but something like near future, like, like telling a story the next 10 years, in the 10 years time. That too is pretty different from when I was living in Beijing, where sci-fi was pretty much off, off uh, limits, and right. now has become more trendy. The, the coming the, Chinese New Year, there are two uh, uh, sci-fi movies. One is uh, by Ning Hao called Crazy Aliens, and the other one, um, it's called The Wandering Earth, I think. The, mm -hmm. I do not know exact English title, but both are 
target for the coming Chinese New Year. Thank you, Carrie. The movie uh, Carrie mentioned, Dying to Survive, is uh, by our honoree at tonight's gala, Xu Zheng, who's an amazingly talented uh, writer, director, actor, and um, we hope you'll get a chance to see it. It does address social issues, the notion of expensive medicines in China, and it could kicked up a huge controversy and discussion around access to medical care in China. Uh, if we can turn to Mr. Yo now, who is a veteran uh, producer and director of Chinese television, uh, huge episodes, wildly popular, many in the tradition of um, mm. traditional Chinese you know, historical dramas. He too uh, was telling us in the green room beforehand that he's turning to internet and mobisodes um, to address some social issues. Uh, Mr. Yo, can you tell us how in your work um, the storytelling is changing today? Mm-hmm. 从事导演工作四十多年一个是历史题材的都在差不多那么从网络开始就囊括了这个中国当年的以及第二年基本上生产出来的电视剧一开始是搜狐提出来的我们需要从今天规范那么到了差不多 
，基本上网络都买都播出，而且这个播出已经形成了一大批的观众。这些观众他的时间不可能像电视台一样的在黄金时段里面来听、来看，而是自己自由选择。所以，互联网很快这个网剧就开始兴起了，然后互联网就开始做一些自己的网剧。那么现在的互联网情况又不一样了。第三年的时候，一开始我我当时我是也是会长，组织了六家公司和爱奇艺，我们准备搞会员制，就搞这个付费式电视剧，啊，呃，这是一二年的想法，一三年开始实施，但是由于这个各个公司都忙于上市，上市以后它就需要，这个立刻完成利润，所以就不太愿意把这个最重要的版权拿到网络来。做这个会员制，那么龚宇先生的爱奇艺的龚宇先生的这个一四年就跟我说，说这个我们早老是搞不起来怎么办？我说你不要等了，你开始吧，你不用等制作业了，你自己先开始啊。我当然我说我也会支持你，比如说我的当年的片子，我说那就给你吧，你就拿去播吧。那么，所以应该从一四年开始，他实行了会员制以后，当年他就有了三千多万的用户，这个发展的非常快，始料未及。当时其他两个网站，阿里啊，这个这个叫做呃腾讯啊，都还没意识到，他突然就就起来了。其实这些规律都是可以看到的，啊，可以看到的。所以现在嘛，基本上三大网站。已经占据了中国市场，是吧？三这基本上他们一年的自我的生产的片子。不好意思，我要问一下。呃、uh, ，Please forgive me. I want to interrupt and ask a question.、Um, we've heard about this massive growth on the internet platforms, and we talked earlier about、um, tastes and what is、uh, censored and what isn't. And Mr. Yo, can you help our audience understand? What standards of censorship are applied differently to different platforms? Can you get something on TV or on the big screen that is different than you can get onto the internet? And how is that changing? In 2017, before the end of the year, in general, there is a difference between the two. So at that time, the internet and the movies are self-produced. So if there is a problem, it is done. 政府在提出提出意见，在下架。那么严格的说起来，二零一七年下半年以后，基本上也虽然还是自审自播，但是五百万投资以上的这种剧目，这个网络都是基本上先报，所以它跟电视剧的审查制度差不多了。严格的说起来，没有什么呃特别的分野啊。这个所以呃，从政府的角度来讲呢。这个我觉得，真正有经验的制作者，对这个，呃，他的审查也都基本上比较清楚，啊，有些嘛，呃，明显不行的你就别去碰它了，包括，啊，当然有些我觉得也是很正常的，因为这个大众传媒，所以你包括说脏话呀，呃，有一些不太适合于青少年看的东西啊。因为它没有分级制度嘛，所以它当然是有所限制。我觉得这个大家都已经很习惯了。那么，但是每一段时间又有每一段时间的不同的特征，啊，你像在网剧兴起的时候是比较呃虚幻的、脱离现实的，这个比较自由的一个状态啊，呃，用他们的话来讲叫这个二次元啊，脑子要简单点。给我的刺激要强烈点，啊，那么现在也不完全是了，呀，我觉得从这两年以来，网剧的质量明显提高，网剧的内容也都相对的来讲，样已经比较重大一些了，它可以有钱了。Thank you. I want to just point out for anybody who is new to this arena that it's true in China that there isn't a rating system the way we enjoy here in the United States, which makes The job of the censor, all that more important,、uh, and 
that much more important to cooperate with them as you're trying to figure out how to get content onto each of these different platforms. So we've just heard from Carrie and Mr. Yo, um, who are focused on the Chinese market and entertaining Chinese language consumers inside China. But to Mr. Yo's left, we have Doris Fardresher. I want to say welcome. Doris and I have spoken on the phone a couple of times over the years. And Doris is uh, here with a special guest today who I want to acknowledge. Doris is here with her mom, um, Annie Walker, who is somewhere in the audience, I She's hope. over there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there she is. Welcome, Mrs. Walker. Um, Mrs. Walker founded the company Doris now runs, WellGo USA. WellGo is based in Texas and is responsible um, for many, many of the biggest Chinese language films coming here to the United States uh, on many different platforms, not least of which the big screens in a theater near you. If you live on uh, the coasts or in a city with a considerable Chinese diaspora, population who are moviegoers and movie enthusiasts. Uh, if you subscribe to any number of uh, services on television and cable and on the internet that provide Chinese language content, Doris is the woman to ask because she is bringing film and TV from Carrie and Mr. Yo to us here in the United States and elsewhere. So welcome, Doris. Thank welcome, you. Mom. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, please tell us. Um, What's the challenge today in breaking open this growing market for people like my 14-year-old daughter who lives in Brooklyn, speaks a little bit of Chinese, remembers fondly her years in China, and could lead her friends into being the next generation of Amer Americans who mm -hmm. are not Chinese by ancestry, but who are growing to understand and appreciate Chinese language entertainment? What's the challenge? What's new? Well, what's new is, uh, so when we started releasing Chinese movies um, in the U.S., uh, which was probably 2008 when we really started concentrating on it, there were only a couple of other companies that were doing it, and I mean concentrating on, you know, the, that Chinese language. Um, there were a few companies that were releasing here and there, but, um, you know, were really consistent about it. Um, and over the last 10 years, you've seen, uh, obviously, a, a, a growth because there's so many more Chinese movies that are, you know, released in the U.S. than it was 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, studios are coming in and, and, and doing more that's uh, targeting the Chinese diaspora. Um, you know, production companies are coming in and wanting to even start up distribution companies in the U.S. Um, to, to get their movies released. Um, and... You're talking uh, about Chinese production companies yeah. setting up distribution yeah. outfits here in Absolutely. the United States. Um, and um, even, you know, your, your subscription VOD platforms are, are, are you know, acquiring these movies um, and putting it on their platforms, um, which is making it more readily available not only to the Chinese diaspora, but also to the crossover audience. So how many um, titles did you... Um, and perhaps mom can chime in here, bring in when you first started the company, and how has that uh, so manifest in 2018? We, um, when we first started um, releasing, it was maybe a couple a year, mm -hmm. um, or not even that, maybe two or three uh, around that time. Um, and what we found that was challenging was because we have to, you know, to, in order to um, target the Chinese diaspora, you really have to release it very close to China's release date. And in order to do that, it's very difficult. Explain to the audience why that's important. Oh, so there's a piracy issue <laughs> where, um, you know, when, as soon as uh, it's released in theaters, um, if you wait too long, you'll, you'll, It'll be available online, and the and the audience that we're really targeting in theaters is is the Chinese community, and they would rather just you know find it online, get it for free. So you'll see a massive decline in your box office um, once it's available online. Um, so either piracy or through you know now digital platforms, it's such a close, shorter window. But you've been able to, to be. shorten the delay between the original release in China and your release here considerably, haven't you? Um, depends on, so, so when we release movies, we're really targeting two different audiences, Chinese movies specifically. 
we're targeting the, the Chinese diaspora, and then we're targeting movies that can go um, kind of broader, um, that uh, you know, hopefully crosses over into um, you know, uh, maybe a fanboy ba you know, base with your martial arts films, or art house audiences like Shadow, which we're releasing next You're year. You're describing the teenage me. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was watching Hong Kong gangster yeah, films. absolutely. Here in Los and Angeles at the Lemley. Yeah, this, you know. that is absolutely our demo. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so that's, uh, so it just depends on, you know, obviously um, the movie, it depends on the genre, it depends on, um, you know, a lot of factors uh, and how we feel that the movie will, who's the audience for it. Um, because it's really funny, what we find is that the Chinese movies that are specifically for the Chinese diaspora, they will show up in theaters. Um, but the martial arts fans or the art, I mean, unless it's an art house movie, but martial arts fans won't. So we'll find movies that do well only theatrically, but there's really no home entertainment, um, whether it's you know, VOD or DVD. Like, um, you know, maybe rom uh, comedies, Chinese comedies, um, or, you know, um, I mean, just th those uh, specific genres. But then you have an action movie, and it doesn't do well in theaters. It does well in on-home entertainment. Mm -hmm. So it's really, uh, it really depends on, uh, on the genre, on how we, we track films coming out of China, what mm -hmm. we f how we feel it's going to do in China, mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of, you know, uh, navigate around that and then um, so the windowing de it, it's if we're targeting the Chinese community no the window has mm -hmm. to be as close to the mm -hmm. the China release that is possible if we're targeting an art house or you know outside of an a, um, uh, you know crossover audience then you know we need more time and that's huh. what I mean has been challenging is because in order to really you know you taking materials and getting mm -hmm. a, a, a a DCP, you know, to put it in theaters um, when the the production and the post production is such a close window to the China release date, mm -hmm. it's very challenging to get those materials in. What does the marketing look like when you're trying to target not the Chinese diaspora mm -hmm. but a broader audience that's perhaps new or, as you say, a you know, fanboy? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it's it's like a it's like releasing an independent film, like an American okay. independent film, or in you know Shadow, for example, we're releasing that. Um, and Shadow targeting is the upcoming film from director Zhang Yimou. Zhang Yimou. Yeah. Um, when will that be released by you? Um, I think we're targeting March of next year. Mm -hmm. um, and the China release date is? It, that, but China was released in September, yeah, I think, a couple right? of months yeah. ago. Um, That's so, right. you know, we don't expect the Chinese audience to show up, I mean, in mm -hmm. the theaters, but we expect it to be more of an art house mm -hmm. um, crowd. And, but we also... Um, so that campaign is absolutely going to look like, um, you know, just a, a, a art house release um, mm -hmm. and more on, you know, targeting the American audience. Mm -hmm. Doris, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, seated to Doris's left is somebody who might be competing with Doris in one way or another, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> depending on how we hear uh, what Mr. Jack Gull has to say. He's a veteran of many big, well-known media companies. And uh, he and I had a really fascinating conversation about his newest venture just last night in which he's going to take this little device in your hand and turn it into a movie theater. Uh, I won't say much more. I'll let Jack explain how it is that his new company um, is going to revolutionize the way Chinese language content uh, reaches its consumers. So tell us what's new from where you sit, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Jamison. Uh, instead of the competition, I think I am, uh, what we're doing is try to really to figure a way to unlock the potential, mm -hmm. how to increase the size of the pie to really make more money for distribution and studios. So the topic today is really fit of what I have been doing after those years when I was responsible for AMC, Legendary Picture, and all those. We had really the dream to see in terms of today's the business model, in terms of the theater model, what it meant to really figure a way, especially in China, to four times of the attendance and to hit 100 billion RMB box office sooner than what Mike just showed up the chart. With that is the dream in our mind. So along with the other few of my funding partners, 
we launched a service called Smart Cinema. In Chinese, we call Yi Dong Dian Ying Yuan, which is a mobile exhibition. In last May, with the authorized the trial permit from the regulators, we call this new format of the movie exhibition in the industry. So we, as one of the pilot with the uh, the exclusive pilot for a few years, we launched the service. What it is is basically to convert your mobile screen to the movie theater screens, to convert your mobile phone to a projector. So everything else are pretty much the same. Now we are already released the 15 new movies in the newly theatrical release window, and box office everything else models seem as the, the conventional exhibition. Uh, basically, for the hundred years, or might be the first time in this kind, which is we have the dream to see how we really the change of model from the movie goers you go to the movie to the movie goes you movie receiver,、mm-hmm. which is very meaningful in China, which we have the few challenges in the industry for a long time. First of all. Even though we keep on increasing the number of screens, the physical theater coverage for China still very minimum. Last year, if we have the attendance of 1.6 billion tickets sold, with primarily in the major cities, we estimate still have the 80 percent of population in China hasn't gone to the theater yet. Given the what had happened, primarily the top, the winner take all, the top five winning movies took like 90 percent of box office, 86 percent of screening times. All the rest of the Hindi movie, Hindi movie,、uh, art movie from all different type of variety of movies, majority of them never get a chance to be screened even for one screen. At the same time, the fixed time. Fixed location, fixed title type of model of existing theaters, considerably change, challenge the exhibition model today. Same as the U.S., the China every year attendance to the theaters going per screen are going down. So last year, roughly about 14.2 percent, meaning every movie you showing 85 seats are empty. Which primarily is not really fit, especially new generation, the customer-centric model, which my time, my my title type of important. So I always be challenged to see how we really hand it over, the right of the programming, the right of the time to be show show the movie, and the right of the title of new title in the release time window, hand it over from the theater. To the consumer, so smart cinema was launched in China, which has become big deal in the industry. It's very controversial, but today, after we piloted for five months, released 50 plus movies, 50 uh the plus movies. Now the industry started to recognize this is inevitable. That's the direction to go, and we see how we will develop it down the road, because there's a fundamentally change. The distribution model for this industry. We had the dream in our mind to see with the smart cinema how we can quickly to four or five times attendance. I give you one number for that. Last year in China, we had 1.6 billion tickets sold attendance. In the back of the history, about 40 years ago, attendance of the movie by then. Which is less than 40 percent of population, was about 29.3 billion. So today we're one fifteenth of the attendance compared to what time we have there. So today the smart cinema are being launched. We're piloting with the authorities supported and the industry、uh, excitement. We see how we can deliver the movie in addition of 9,000 plus theaters. 
to 1.4 smart cinema smartphone screens to your pocket. So that's what we, we see. We're the first time, of, first of this kind. We're piling to China to see, to see what that meant to the industry. And with the uh, estimate, we feel like if we launch this right, and we can serve the customer by the way they want it anytime, any place as a title. So we have the dream within three years, we can drive or addition the China market box office from current about 60 billion or so to 100 billion yuan. Remarkable. And tell me, uh, Jack, can you explain at what point in the near future might the platform smart cinemas also include films from other places? Or will this be, for the time being, limited to Chinese language content? So far, during of the piloting time, smart cinema was operated and regulated exactly the same as Wanda cinemas. Mm -hmm. So basically, any movie you can show on the cinema would have the, the dragon sale, mm -hmm. which is a permit, and the date, the release date, and the time it can show, basically we call it the key. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's about the month. Mm -hmm. So all the movies showing on the smart cinema are the same as the cinemas on, the, uh, on the, all the other theaters. And are, At the the same cinemas, time, are the cinemas upset with you that you might be uh, which are, there, cannibalizing there's a, there's their audience? There are certain concerns, but yeah. majority of people feel like that's the inevitable, that direction to go. Yeah. That's the new way to live for this industry, mm -hmm. which is 100, 100 years now. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that China, the, the mobile technology, the mobile payments, mm -hmm. and the digital ticketing, and 70% of young people consume the long video content through those smartphones. Mm -hmm. rather than the bigger screens. Mm -hmm. Given all this, the background, or the, uh, the environment, mm -hmm. so this inevitable that's like a smart cinema mm -hmm. or mobile exhibition mm -hmm. will come up. Mm -hmm. And that will be the enormous good news for the studios, for the distribution folks, mm -hmm. because they have enormous channel which a very specific target customer. Why would they choose your platform versus IT or Tencent, for instance? We are operating within the new theoretical window. Mm -hmm. So the primary model is the same as a theater, mm -hmm. which we are sort of like retail of the, the uh, studio and distribution to screen your movie within the theoretical window which is fundamentally important as a key vital to the industry. Box office, one person, one take, one movie, like a democratic vote, mm -hmm. collect together is the core mm -hmm. of the whole thing for this industry, which is very venture capital-like. Mm -hmm. Because the high risk, but the high, high return. Mm -hmm. The reason you have high return, because you have window theoretical release, have the box mm -hmm. office, which is, could be really have the potential upside. If you kill that, I mean, no, it won't work. When we spoke last night, I asked you, um, how do you prevent me from logging into smart cinemas and then having 10 of my friends watch the movie over my shoulder? How is it one box office? Well, uh, today we are, are have, we, 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 my personally, I really believe that's a one person, one movie, uh, the one tickets model is vital to this part. So all our technology behind work with Apple devices, pieces, to make a third thing happen. That's a fundamental technology company. At the back end one, you have the link with the government system. We have the key control period and all that type. And report box office to the authorities. That's one side. So there's this, a time limit on the period in which yes, you can watch this. Yes, exactly. Like so I, it expires. I, yes. Okay. I call that a bookstore model. Okay. And the copyright model it's like a library. It's a very different model. Mm -hmm. And the second part of those is, as Doris just mentioned, is anti-piracy. How to protect the digital content of a new movie, which is a major chunk of our investment at the back end, along with the devices provider. Third component is more important, which is the movie is a serious entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's not like a flip of a uh, thing, what do you wait for the boss? Mm -hmm. You pay that kind of money, so that will be showed with 2K, which is the first time ever mm -hmm. 
with the DG, DCP show on the uh, small devices. Mm -hmm. So when you glimpse through these screens, you can tell easily this is a smart cinema content versus mm -hmm. anything else. So Those are the core components. And at the same time, even though the 70% of the consumers today in China mm -hmm. consume the long format, format content through the smartphones, mm -hmm. still pe certain people want a larger screen. Yeah. So that are we aligned with our VR glass, VR goggle partners. I they already see. created the devices or been launched last month in Guangzhou, mm -hmm. aligned with the smart cinema, so that literally you have the device on, on you, mm -hmm. which is it's not really VR. This just make that it's a mobile larger screen. Okay. So that give you back that content. The key component for those, I'm, I'm okay with that devices. A lot of people use it already. But I feel like I'll be happier have that device if it has all the social a component of the video. So mm. when you sit there, your girlfriend next to you, even she is in Tokyo, but you can watch the movie at the same time. Mm. Even I've already launched this uh, smart cinemas only five months so far. I never thought of the enormous demand actually came in through the social network. Mm -hmm. The boy chasing after the girl sent a ticket with live chat, mm -hmm. and the boss is buy the ticket for all these employees, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the charity companies basically pay that for all the Yunnan provinces, mm -hmm. which make our major uh, mm -hmm. release of success in those places. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones I never thought of. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Look like from technology perspective, it's much easier to export it than mm -hmm. services. Right. So I always keep in mind about 60 million overseas Chinese mm -hmm. who are dying to see some hot movies inside China, mm -hmm. which is like harder for them to do. Today, it's make it much easier. So we already kicked off our services in Spain and Italy mm -hmm. in Europe uh, today. Um, so as a pilot, so we're exploring the potential opportunity for even bigger population place like North America. That sounds remarkable and is a good moment to segue to our final guest, Ding Cao, who is a lawyer and an attorney who's done business on both sides of the Pacific in China and in here in Hollywood. She's based here now with O'Melveny and Myers and um, working between the cultures of Hollywood and the Chinese film industry what ways, based on what you've heard about content production and distribution and now new platforms, what ways are the terms of the deal changing? What's new? Uh, sure. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so first of all, I want to make a confession. Like, I'm one of those Chinese people who live in LA but only managed to see one Chinese movie during the last year. Um, Honesty is <laughs> well priced here. Part of it is I'm based in LA, but most of it is because I have a young baby. But uh -huh. um, I want to say I think I can no longer blame the fact that I'm based in LA that I so-called have no access to Chinese content because thanks to people like Dol uh, Doris, like there are movies, like Chinese movies in the theater um, as an audience the new trend I saw is that I used to have to drive miles and miles to Alhambra to this particular AMC <laughs> yeah. to see Chinese movie. But now there actually are more Chinese movies showing at some prime locations, like for example, AMC in Central City Mall, mm -hmm. like uh, World War II uh, was released there and a couple of other Chinese titles. That was something I didn't see years ago. And also the only Chinese movie I saw was actually on a flight from LA to Hawaii. <laughs> so it, just like think about that, I used to get to see Chinese content when I fly back and forth between LA and Shanghai, which is normal because that's your destination and of course there will be some local language content on it. But for a domestic flight between LA and Hawaii, I would not expect I would be able to find some you know, multiple Chinese movies available for me to pick and choose. So I get to see Monster Hunter 2. Uh, I'm a fan of animation movie. So I saw that one in China, uh, the first one in China, and then like, you know, I want to see the sequel. So anyway, so as an audience, I see all these like, you know, developments and then shows like you know, Chinese content and more and more like, available, even for people who are based in the US. And also, not to mention like, you know, an Xbox service provider like you know, Netflix. Mm -hmm. They are acquiring Chinese mm -hmm. content. 
or release on their platform, so um, more and more people here can see those contents. Mm -hmm. So put on my lawyer hat um, in terms of the new trend I see. So I think um, two major changes uh, from my perspective. First one is, um, as a lot of people know, that there is um, relatively recent uh, regulation change or shift that restrict outbound investment made by Chinese investors. So uh, we don't want into to- Into particular segments. Into so particular there. segments. Uh, we don't need to dig into the rationale, but um, that definitely put a, um, like not, I don't say a complete ban, but like it make it much harder for Chinese investors to come to the US and make investment into the entertainment sector. Um, but like in the meantime, like the restriction is drafted in a way um, seem to leave some like a room for people to make different types of deals. So for example, there were a lot more discussions about slate deals. So people come in want to make equity investment into like production companies, distribution companies, or studios here, or want to do a longer term slate transactions with like you know US producers or studios. Um, now we see more one like picture picture based like you know discussions. So we were just chatting earlier on upstairs and uh, um, Carrie mentioned that you know many people call her or contact her to get rights to some individual movies um, made or the rights were controlled by Sony. So that leads to the second change um, I want to bring up is um, I see that Chinese investors um, demand more rights when they negotiate deal with their US partners. So like decades ago or like you know a few years ago, Chinese investors seem to be viewed as a pure financiers. So they come here, they give you money, and then you still have complete creative control about what you want to do and also how you release the movie. So a lot of Chinese investors want to just have a share of financial return or even just merely have it, like their name showing in the opening credits. So now it definitely has changed a lot. Investors from China become more and more sophisticated and they are fluent in English so they can negotiate deal in like, you know, um, like in English lifetime. And also they understand, they are prepared like, you know, to negotiate the terms they want. So they know what they want. So if we say, English language content, they come here, they want to have the rights to release the picture in China, so they want the China distribution rights, sometimes greater China distribution rights, and also they will ask for a piece of the derivative rights. So most noticeably is the rights to make a Chinese version of the English content, mm -hmm. which is not um, something they typically ask before. But now, like you know, increasingly we see that people, you know, require more rights that will be beneficial to them when they take this, you know, investment back to China. So, like a few examples, like um, we represented um, Huawei Brothers in their negotiation with Sony Studio actually a couple of years ago in their acquisition of the China remake rights for um, a title called Only You. So um, I think the Chinese title called Ming Zhong Zhu Ding. So it's a um, romantic comedy, well, more like a rock romance uh, movie. So that was a couple of years ago. And then um, recent years, um, I was not involved, but like I saw that um, there was a hit in Chinese theater, which is called Xi Hong Shi Shou Fu. I think it's Hello, Mr. Billionaire, right? And that was based on an adaptation, actually, of a 1985 title called um, Brewster's Millions. So, um, so, with all these contracts, like people were asking for rights, whether all of them lead to a Chinese production, not necessarily, but people start to like emphasize on those derivative rights, and then they understand there is a value about it. And if the content is right, and also it's something can be translated into Chinese, not just like you know language like wise, but also culture wise, it's something people can relate to with not too much like a major like changing a uh, change to the storyline, that's something people would prefer to have. So that's my uh, two cents. Thank you. It's a remarkable evolution. I remember when I was living in Beijing, um, 
over a decade ago, a friend of mine was responsible for bringing the American version of Ugly Betty, which originally was a telenovela from Latin America, to China to satellite television in China and remade it in Chinese. And what you're describing here is a new appetite for mining the library of Hollywood and other cultures. Um, we talked earlier about um, French films being remade in Chinese, doing an end run around the Hollywood remake of French films and going straight to the French copyright holder for the Chinese remake. Ladies and gentlemen, sadly, I have once again expended all of the time that I had hoped to save for questions from you. I'm going to look to our organizers to see whether we might please have just a few more moments. We're getting a, a thumbs up. Great. Jonathan Karp, thank you very much. Uh, Executive Director of the Asia Society, Southern California. Um, glad to be invited back here by him. Uh, so now I will give the panelists the prerogative to ask the first question of one another. Does any one of you have a question for any of your neighbors? I have one for Jack. OK. So Doris has <laughs> no. a question for Jack. Look out. No, actually, I, no, I was actually curious. Um, uh, so when uh, the, the price structure, are you, is it the same price structure as a ticket? In, um, and, and I thought about this, and I would have interrupted, but <laughs> I didn't want to. But is it the same price structure as a ticket to, to buy in, in the movie theater is the same um, to buy it on the smart cinema. That was my question too, yeah. actually. Right. Yeah. Going to ask right. questions. Same, same like I should have mentioned that actually earlier. Um, the tax price for the smart cinema per movie today is a 25 yuan RMB, okay. like $3.50. I'll, I'll give you a little of the, uh, the background of why I make that price for that. For one, in China today, the tax price for different cities is very different. Similar like in the US, mm -hmm. like our AMC in US is like $9 by average in the country, but in New York, a center seat is $22, mm -hmm. or, right? So it depends which part of the, the country. But the average, like that. China is like the first tier cities could be $10, $15 versus others. But by average in China, the theoretical uh, take the price about 35 RMB. Mm -hmm. So I, make, I take the price for smart cinema by 25. Mm -hmm. I, for that viewing extremely expensive mm. online per movie, per, the, per, per view. Mm, okay. the, the, but I feel like a movie is a serious business. And another part, the smart cinema was not established to cannibalize the physical theater, since that's not the purpose. Mm -hmm. That actually to really fill in the blank for the 80% of people, it's not even covered. Mm -hmm for the 80 plus of percent of the movie that be released, and for the majority of people who are not able to come to theater for whatever reason, like especially traveling folks. Mm -hmm. So that is a purpose for, for those. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is, that the it's tech price. It enhances it. That's yeah, the tech price doesn't mean doesn't vary for different places okay. or different projects. Got it. But uh, that turned out to be interestingly, there are people to buy in the tickets, mm -hmm. uh, especially the flight delay for two hours or the live play for two hours, so everybody can be annoyed and airline companies say, look, hold on, I'll give you everybody a ticket. I just be quiet and watch a movie. <laughs> you know, that type. I, I never realized that was the, per that was the demand. And suddenly you see the people from different purposes by the tickets, and I saw that I'm, I'm the B2C model, turned out to be like a B2B2C model. Hmm. For whatever reason, a lot of B yeah. to buy the tickets. <laughs> A, a boy chasing after the girl to buy that ticket, send it over. That time, 25 is better than five. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's, that's value on that. So that's what I'm currently doing today. And I feel like we got to have the value of this for the movie business. Mm -hmm. and, and cinema, smart cinema, is a serious box office generation. And on, as addition of existing the cinemas. So that was the, uh, the purpose of those. So today, our current release is focused on the air is not covered, the movie not being released, and to cover the folks who are traveling. So our first offering, Beijing to Shanghai, the bullet train. That's our first one to offer a very uh, welcome movie because they have four hours sitting on the train type. 
So that gave everybody a so easy way to download that app with like a minute. And then you can walk it in, only two apps, two taps. When you walk in, like you walk into the lobby of AMC Cinema, they have movie play for you and all the info associated. Second tap, pay 25, you watch the movie. And that is the user experience as a quality that is quite key mm -hmm. for us to provide the service for those. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that, how that goes. And the strong demand driven by the whatever reason of the social network is incredibly encouraging. I, I want to interrupt there and ask another question of the audience. Again, by show of hands, how many people here, how many of the romantics among you has ever purchased a movie ticket online and sent it to somebody you're pursuing romantically? <laughs> uh, anybody, uh, uh, anybody here tried to get a date by sending somebody a digital movie ticket? No. That happens in China all the time. Yep. That happens in China all the time. There's a, a remarkable difference in the way this technology is changing the way movie people are getting new audiences. I um, just wanted to observe that, because I, I find that fascinating. All right, we're now going to turn to the audience. Um, we've got maybe a time for one, two questions. Um, and I'd like you to raise your hand, uh, stand and identify yourself. I believe we have some microphones. So this gentleman here in the second row, please tell us who you are and direct your question to uh, any one of us, please. Uh, Morgan Yaping Wang, uh, partner of uh, BHR PE Fund. I uh, just wrote a question to you on Chinese people where uh, know how to play with the policies. So if you, one guy buys ticket, many people will watch the same time. So how do you do that? The s smart cinema actually was built as a model strictly the one movie, one person at one time. Today, you're not able to review in, you're not able to forward. For, for the, the only feature you have is pulse because you're stepping into airplane. And you click the, the uh, apps, you have the third way, you can streaming, you can Wi-Fi, you can temporarily download for a very short time. So that it has to be without the network play like in the train and the airplane. So 24 kind of hours temporarily download? Basically within the release time. Oh, I see. But so it's a week or two. But remind you that will be off of the theater for, gotcha. for a day to get you reminded. But in the living room, you know, if you download, you buy it, all of six of you can watch together. Yeah, there's a feature like you, there, you can mirror your now, smartphone to the... All the phone features I work with Apple and all that. You're not able to record a screening. You're not to do anything that a kind of flip that to the bigger screen, mm -hmm. sell the ticket to the villagers. Today are the, 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 the that's the, a real thing, by the way. The, today, what do we do? Basically, is only limited to your own private devices. On the one assumption that you probably share with your partner on the bed, but it's never be the good user experience. And people today is not share your phone with your neighbors or anything like that. So today, we feel like that is designated to your phone and only show one time, like a movie uh, tickets. All right, let's take one more can question. I, the woman there. Oh, sorry, Carrie, please. Can we apply to the TV? Yeah, the no. So not you cannot TV. switch the projection from the mobile up to the TV? T yeah, no, because okay. that's, the, I believe, the model. But yeah. by seeing that, I was in Israel for, for 10 days. They created a model for us. Basically, you can project the, the bigger screens, but you have used a earpiece. The beautiful earpiece that it can 10 people watch the same movie in 10 different languages. Hmm. So that, but still can make sure you, you get the tickets per piece. So every year person. piece activates another yeah. ticket charge. And another smart, uh, uh, smart television maker here in the US hmm. gave me the proposal. They can show on the speaker screens, hmm. but a screen can tell how many people are mm -hmm. watching it. Wow. Without, without the privacy thing. This is it's the movies so like watching you, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> this but woman we'll here in the second, uh, there in the middle. Hello. Is the hello. microphone working? Please say Hi. hello. My name is Tony Wong. I just had a question for Jack also. Um, you know, from, I think, I'm an artist and content creator, producer. From, I think, a filmmaker's point of view, you know, there's 
content that is for small screens, there's content for big screens, something that's experienced, that needs to be experienced in a theater, you know, in a dark space with other people. I was wondering, did you ever contemplate maybe for the smart cinema, what about like a VR app that makes you, you know, like a very cheap cardboard um, thing? What do you think about that for the individual to actually experience a cinema experience, but in VR? And then there would be a, you know, one, one time use. Sure. That's a good question. Actually, that's the, when I started uh, this, this new uh, venture, I already kept that in, in mind. If you look today, our theater model is a one too many broadcast model. That's how our business model is today. And smart cinema come, will, ch will enhance that model to one to one which considerably create the new potential in the future. Not only the prepared stage for VR, AR in the future, which is absolutely one-to-one -one model, which the theater cannot do. At the same time, you decide to connect the movie girls finally. We know who are you. And also, you are able to communicate to each other. Like I, that movie reminded me my classmate in the middle school I bought a ticket for 60 of them and we watch it tonight at the same time type. And we're like in one room, we chat each other type. That's already easily to, to, to make that happen. Today, even we launched only five months. Last month in China called Da Peng VR already launched in the brand of smart cinema. What they did, they just make the complicated VR technology to a very simple one. Without wireless, battery lasts four hours only fit for smart cinemas. When you have the, you buy the ticket of the movie in the smart cinema app, app there's a tab, say VR. You tap that tab, and the image will go to the, the, the VR. All the VR does is mobile <coughs> MX. So that's, from hardware perspective, that's very simple devices. All yeah. I like to have that one to be social connected so that your beloved person sit next to you. That's what really I want to have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give a large hand of applause for our guests.